Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everybody, welcome to WT FFF. I'm Tom Hazard, along with... Tracy Hazard. And you know what? We've got another update to a very popular episode uh, that we had in WTFFF from the past. And so this is about 3D printers shifting mind to market 3D manufacturing. So we were want to update this a little bit for 2020. We have some things to share with you. And then we're going to actually, you know, replay that previous episode for those of you that may not have listened to it the first time. Right. Originally, we were talking about how you know, makers were shifting into moving into manufacturing, right? So that we were, we were, there was this sort of shift that was happening in the industry where you were going from be, just making some things, finding out they were viable in the marketplace. Maybe you had an Etsy store, maybe you were, you know, actually selling it um, on your own website, but whatever it was, you were starting to do that and then moving into mass market manufacturing of that. So more quantities, even if they were still personalized. So, you know, we start thinking about 3D printed shoes and, and feet and some of the other things that we we have evaluated over the course of our 580 something episodes here right so we've talked about these things in in pockets in various places but now we're looking at that as an update here to looking at the viability and the growth of the 3d manufacturing side of things and reality is is it's necessary right now we need the 3D manufacturing flexibility. We need the sustainability of it. We need the supply chain management. We need the controls of it. But just as important as some of the things that we were talking, we're talking about in the episode that you're going to hear is we need the personalization, the mass customization. So the ability to make these things, but also make them personal. Well, making them personal and in addition to that, Tracy, you know, distributed manufacturing. You know, there is a lot more 3D you know, print manufacturing capacity that is distributed worldwide than there was when we recorded this episode. I mean, certainly, like you said, with makers, individuals had 3D printers and they were able to make things locally. But now you've got a lot more of a manufacturing infrastructure. And we've seen how that a lot of that has applied to the manufacturing locally of valves for hospitals in need of IV drip valves and, and the PPE sort of aids and masks and things that people have been making here for the needs at hospitals with COVID-19. So certainly the infrastructure is much more robust than it was. Absolutely. And, and we're going to be talking about in some upcoming episodes that haven't aired yet, so you got to stay tuned for those. But we're going to be talking about post-processing techniques, materials, textures, how we simulate them, how we create them in the computer, how we then print them out and make them viable, right? So we're going to be talking about some of that in these upcoming episodes. And, and these things go hand in hand because they were some of what we were critical of in the beginning of it that were holding back that sort of more full-scale manufacturing process. So a lot of these things have been solved over the last, I would say, five years. And they really come to a place at which it makes it very viable to run a 3D manufacturing uh, operation of any kind. Now, I want to step back, though, and just mention a little bit more about that uh, mass customized idea and that sure. personalized idea, because I think we need to step one into that further. And I think there's some really amazing things that we have reviewed and we've talked about on the show before. Like we talked about printing 3D medicines, right? 3D printing medicines that would be special release, that they were custom printed for your body. So they were the right um, amounts. They were the right mixes of it. So, you know, really talking about dialing in 3D print medicine and, you know, thinking about these things and, and not just that as a, that's an internal example of it, right? But thinking about it in terms of a personalized fit, function, all of those things, right? we start to realize that so much of our world is dominated by being designed for a six foot male. You and I know that because we designed office chairs for so long and the major innovation that we came up with was, well, let's make them a little bit more adjustable. Let's make the arms move up so you can scooch a little closer. And if you're shorter like me, right? Like that's how we came about to looking from it from a design perspective. And all of a sudden the market went, thank goodness there's stuff for us, right? And there is such a need for that in this broader product-based and in, in even industrial product-based, right? We're looking for customized solutions for everything that we do. And so being able to do that at the end of process is or at where you do most of 
of the parts for your product might be manufactured, but then you're adding 3D components at the end. Like those are viable and really exciting changes to the whole manufacturing cycle. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we've also seen some things like that. Talk about mass customization, Tracy. We've seen that with footwear. You know, remember with a company like Weave and they're manufacturing certain parts of their shoes, their sandals, uh, orthotics, whatever, that are are pre-manufactured. And then, like you said, end of process customization. And uh, I, I do see that increasing. I mean, people not only are really not going out to you know, the big box retail stores as much as they were to, yeah. to buy things. And even when they do, like you said, Tracy, it's, it's, you know, you get one choice, maybe two, and there's not a lot of color and there's not a lot of fit you know, choices, size accommodation, right? Right. So, you know, we're starting to get into this world where we expect thanks to digital apps and all kinds of things. We expect a really personalized experience. So consumers are starting to get, um, and businesses for that matter, if you're doing business to business sales, right? We're starting to get really dissatisfied with this, with companies and products that don't understand us, that don't get us. And that's really sort of paved the way for this mind to market shift that we've been talking about, right? It's already shifting consumer behavior in expecting this. So when it doesn't happen, there's a disappointment level. And so that's where 3D printing is so br brilliant, right? It's so flexible. It gives us so much opportunity. But now the design tools are keeping up with it. The how we deliver to people, like the ability to provide customized shopping carts and customized shopping experiences, right? Those are happening as well. So, you know, thank goodness for companies like Weave and Feats and those kind of people who have been paving the way for all of that, right? So we can take measurements on an app on our phone and then create customized response that gets made and delivered to us and tracked for us so we can see our personalized, you know, product being made. So like all of those things have really shifted that mind to market and really making the 3D manufacturing on a personalized and customized basis, you know, it's really supplementing where the makers start testing it. And then we move into the manufacturers who can start making it and really delivering these absolutely personalized 3D print solutions to people. It's really exciting. And I'm, I'm pleased to see where it's going. And I think the future is just as bright for 3D printing as I thought it was when we started this pod, or as maybe I should say, as I hoped it was when we started this podcast. <laughs> That's right. right. You know, and, and I think that it also leads to something we talked about earlier in this series, the sustainability of things, right? Mm -hmm. Less shipments, these, you know, these types of delivery systems of being able to manufacture at close to the consumer, gosh, that's going to be so amazing. Or in your facility, if it's a business to business solution, right? Being able to do that and lower the transportation costs, lower the material usages, lower all of those things really makes for a sustainable business opportunity in the future. Well, I couldn't agree more, Tracy. Well, you know what? I think it's time to replay that episode. I think you're going to get a lot of value out of it, but I think it'll be interesting to think about what we said then in the context of today. A lot of it definitely still applies, but there definitely is, I think, some new opportunities here. So let's listen to 3D printer shifting, mind to market 3D manufacturing. I like the subject today because it deals with really paradigm shifts, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, we were debating this off air, and so we thought we'd bring this on air. And the idea is that there's been this sort of tug of war between makers and manufacturers and who's going to make the most of 3D printing and who kind of owned tipping it and making it happen and getting awareness for it. And my perspective and what I've been kind of not arguing, but a proponent for is the idea that makers may have pushed the reality of 3D printing into saying, this doesn't just belong in prototyping anymore. This belongs in end product making. And now we have to push it out of the maker's hands and back into the reality of market manufacturing. So using 3D printing to make real products. And so kind of it has to actually go back and forth. And there needs to be this sort of collaboration between what we've learned rather than treating it like the maker's world is its own little isolated world and the manufacturer's world is its own little isolated entity. Actually, they're completely intertwined, right? That's and, right. And really dependent on each other, I would think. Right. And if we don't learn smartly in the manufacturing side from what makers can do, we won't be incorporating enough customization or cool products that are 
consumer viable. And we learn this so often, you make stuff that nobody wants to buy because you didn't understand what the world wanted, right? Makers are closer to that because they're consumers that are making. That's really the reality of how close they are. Well, that gets tricky because the reality is everyone is a consumer in some way, whether they're a minor consumer, they buy most of the things for their household, or they're a major consumer or a minor consumer, right? So we're all consumers. But I think all too often, people don't really think about markets on a large scale and the realities of consumers in general and what's going to make something successful, what's going to not. So it's interesting because makers tend to make things that are more short run or even one off and you don't need to appeal to a big market. Of course, you're not going to sell a whole heck of a lot of them either that way. But I think definitely 3D printing is uniquely suited to make a quantity of one over and over and over again in different ways. Right. It's a great bridge to the two worlds. And that's what we've seen from it from the beginning, that the opportunity is there for you to do the whatever can pay the bills and make the money by manufacturing them in multiples, but also be able to have this wonderful customizable option and to have those things built into the system in which you can do both at the same time, that they don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I think it's true that makers in the United States States, just speaking in particular about the United States, was probably true of many really modern industrialized countries, not what are considered to be the major world factories at this point, like China and other Asian countries. But in the United States, makers really have paved the way for manufacturing to be relevant again in areas where manufacturing had completely died in this country. Right. I mean, you're able to make it localized again. You've given demand to products and materials that weren't there before and are back again. So, yeah, I mean, it, just the idea of that it's worth waiting for something that's special, just that in and of itself, that mindset shift has been critically important. That not everything has to be delivered in an hour by a drone. It could be, you know, three days and it's still personalized. Yeah, absolutely. I think that mindsets and paradigms are changing, right? About there has been this culture ever since really Federal Express became real, right? <laughs> became something that even before the internet existed, Federal Express was really already there. And all of a sudden, when you have an important document or have some sort of package, I mean, overnight, not only became possible, but then it became sort of demanded or expected. And if you want it, you want it now. Why do you have to wait? There's overnight shipping. You can do that now. So this became this expectation that, you know, you got to have it now. And I think in a lot of ways, the big box manufacturers, and because throughout the 90s and even starting before the 90s, but especially in the 90s, these big box chains were opening as many stores as they could possibly open each year. And a huge part of their sales growth had to do with how many stores they could open. What other regions of the United States had they not saturated yet that they could put more stores? And then as you shift into the 2000s, they do get saturated, right? And there's no more places to expand and their growth their entire business model of growth has to change, right? right? In this case, they just try to acquire their competitors. But it's still happening. That's a really interesting dichotomy because there's been all these reports about how Amazon has now proliferated so many warehouses in so many areas that they're essentially within two days of almost every consumer in this country. Oh, they definitely are. Yeah. And that kind of proliferation wasn't happening unless you were Walmart before that. So, you know, you want to look at what's going on is that that's happening on one hand, but at the same time, we are as consumers, thanks to makers and thanks to Etsy and other places like that, shown that that's viable and we are interested in the idea of having something special that isn't just available sitting on a warehouse shelf somewhere. Absolutely. And I think actually it's been now a couple decades at least of sort of experiencing American consumers experiencing big box retail and the fact that, well, they don't have exactly what they want, maybe necessarily. It's not in the exact color they want or some other feature, but it's what's there. It's what's available. And so they buy it, sometimes reluctantly, if it's not exactly what they want. That I think that what's happening now is actually a response to what big box retail has conditioned the mass American consumer to, and that everything you buy there is vanilla. I mean, maybe vanilla and chocolate, but that's about it. You certainly don't get 31 flavors of everything. That's maybe a too old a reference. But I also think that there's an interesting thing that we're not talking about about it. The fact that there's, there's a larger portion of makers that are women 
Whereas in the manufacturing world, 85%, I just read the report, it was out that 85% of engineering and designers in that consumer product world are men. Yet consumers are 85% women. Well, I agree with that. And we've recognized that's been a problem with why so many products, I mean, bringing a product to mass market retail is a very risky proposition because it takes a huge amount of dollars, takes millions of dollars to develop, manufacture and distribute that product. And not just for the manufacturer, but for the retailer. A retailer commits like a Target or a Staples or something like that commits to putting one single SKU at retail. It means that it's going to take five to 6,000 and depending on what it is, maybe as many as 10,000 pieces, if it's a really small product, and they're going to carry a few more of them per store just to fill that pipeline. That's millions of dollars committed. It's a big bet you have to make, right? But in that process, though, when you have someone who's in control who doesn't have a core understanding, and in the case of for what we were talking about, it's not only a highly imbalanced in terms of men versus women, but it's imbalanced of people who are even in the country in which they're selling into. So we have a large portion of Asian engineering and design happening for an American market. So not that only they don't understand that they don't understand, yeah. and then there's a gender difference on top of that. So when you have those things to compound, it's really where, in a sense, makers are saying hey, a lot of us makers are women. And in that maker process, we've proven that there is more traction to better quality, better personalized, better connection to what women want to buy. It makes for a better, more viable product long term. It's not a risky proposition. Right. No, I agree. I think that that's been, you know, there's a lot of issues with what makes it risky at mass market retail. And part of it is just the financial commitment that I was talking about. But the other big risk is if you don't put something out there, That 85% of the shoppers in that store want to buy, guess what? 15% of the shoppers are not enough for a product to make it. you got to appeal to more people. And that's hard to do because everybody doesn't want to just buy vanilla. So I agree that makers and the Etsy community and all this have been a response to that. And certainly there are a lot of women makers. They've probably, I don't know if they've outnumbered men historically, but certainly more of the retail supply chain, if you will, for makers has probably been the Joanne Fabrics of the world, the Michaels Arts and Crafts. And I think more women are definitely shopping those stores than men, no question. But the 3D printing, the arrival of desktop 3D printing especially, has brought a lot more men into the maker community. And there always have been men. I mean, the urban workshops of the world and the people in carpentry and in some of these harder materials, there's always been more men than women in making in that sense. Okay, so if we're going to go a little bit sexist here, which Tom and I are more... It's not sexist, it's just reality. Right, but Tom and I are more than willing to go there because we have these discussions all the time. And and it's important to just like call out that elephant in the room. I mean, that's the reality of it. It's it's just the reality. I think it's a believe me. I think it's a shame that there aren't more women engineers and more women designers. I mean, when I was in industrial design school in college, we had... I don't know, probably 50 to 60 people in my class, in my department of industrial design, and a handful of women. I want to say five or six. Right, but how many of those are still practicing? How many of those women? Oh, I don't know. Very few. I think two, only two maybe. of them. Yeah. yeah, maybe. So, you know, what does that say about that? But what I wanted to point out really here is that in sort of that sexist view of that is that that may be why 3D printing is having a hard time getting traction into the consumer product market. Oh, because it's, it's too much of a male it's perspective. It's too much of a male perspective. It. I could not agree more. I because agree 100%. There's, n- there's nothing to me worse than looking at the product catalogs of the directories of files. The file directories. Oh, you mean the repositories? The repositories, like like Thingiverse, like Pinshape, like all of them, actually. There isn't one out there that I think has enough of a tipped value in sort of men versus women in terms of the product offering, but it's not shoppable. That's like the point you have to understand. That's a, is that- that's a problem across, I think, internet retail in general. They're not very shoppable. And it's because of the search engine base of how people have to enter keywords in order to find something. I mean, what sites do you know that are shoppable other than maybe, I mean, do you even think Pinterest, which is decidedly a much more female traffic, uh, pin, uh, Pinterest the one I'm yeah. thinking of? Yeah, Pinterest, the image site that's a much more probably female trafficked site. Is that even shoppable? No. I think it's failed to be shoppable, but not because women aren't sharing the designs there and they're not excited about them and they aren't, but they're not shoppable because by the time they hit Pinterest, they're already out of the store. They're already gone. So there's no place to actually transact and buy them. 
It's the number one complaint I hear from most women who are on Pinterest. So it's, so it's it's a wish list site of something you want, but you can't find it. You can no longer have, yeah. yeah. And how frustrating is that? And so what it is, is it actually has a backlash against those companies that, that try to sell on there. Because by the time they get in there and they get the traction you need and the viralness necessary to get enough attention, it's gone. Mm. And so that's where it would never happen in a 3D printed world because it's never gone. No. Well, so that's it's... where it could work out really well, but no one's trying that to take advantage of it, and they should. Like, that's really a part that's missing. It's like, like an pinching. experience like you walk into a store and you're presented with, whether it's a seasonal offering of things or somehow relevant to, I don't know, something happening in your community or society right. or it, whatever. It's a tagging. It's a keyword. It's a whole thing I like that. But see, the thing is, is that none of those sites have gotten enough value. So they are at the level at which an Amazon is, for instance. So Amazon's algorithm, it serves up to me exactly what I want to see because I've been shopping there since 1997. Well, so they've really... They know me. They've gone to school on you and data mined you. And they have, I guess their algorithms have figured out things that you might have a tendency to want. But not just that. They're paying attention to my gift list and my wish list and all of these things. So they know it's my dad's birthday or it's, you know, they know these things are coming up and typically at this time of year I buy something for him. Like they know that and they're serving these things up to me smartly. And so they understand that mindset set of how I shop and how women shop and how shopping is transacted in general. A file site is organized in this directory category style. It's an organizational structure and that's what these repositories are doing. And it may have worked just fine when you were providing engineering files to someone who needed a part or a component or these things, but it doesn't work in a consumer shopping world. Sure, but to be fair, don't you think that, I mean, Amazon is in a unique position to be able to do that because of the their size because of two decades almost of history here, right? In terms of shopping and studying and cooking what you as a consumer and every other individual consumer does. I mean, every site cannot dial it in the way that Amazon does. No, and I don't disagree. It's a money issue. I mean, it's you're a startup and you're in this certain stage and you're in this infancy setup of the 3D printing file repository world. But I think it's the mind to market strategy that you have to change your mind about who your audience is, who your audience is to today is not the audience you need to be successful and make money. And that's really kind of the shift that I wanted to think about is that makers don't necessarily make enough profits. This is actually how I got my job as a columnist for Inc. I did a lecture on makers making profits. Like how do you become one of those makers? It was really more about how makers are not making profits and what they're doing wrong than it was examples of makers doing it right. Exactly. But it's because the mind shift is different. It's a market-based mindset. So putting your head into how does that market shop? What do they want? Why are they there? What do they not care about? And you know what the market doesn't care about? That it's 3D printed. I agree. <laughs> they don't the, care the value, about that part. The value proposition has to be something other than how it's made because you don't have consumer products highlighting, I'm injection molded. <laughs> That's right. Right? We are rotationally molded. Like, isn't that cool? <laughs> Woohoo. No. So Consumers why are we highlighting care. 3D right. printing, right? right? It's like, it's what is the real value proposition? And why should I, as a consumer, care about your product versus the thousands of others that I get bombarded with. That's right. It's the perfect gift for my dad's birthday. Like that's how the mindset works. So when we can start to shift that and bring in that market and manufacturing mindset that has worked for a while and bring that into the abilities that the maker world has pointed us to, the opportunities of that, that's the real power of the future of on-demand retail 3D printing. And I think we're seeing lately, and I don't know when this episode is publishing compared to some others that you know we've already recorded, but I'll tell you, we're seeing some pieces of the puzzle here and there being done right. Yep. And it gives me great excitement and also anticipation and hope. And, you know, I'm not one to hope really much at all. I see it as a sort of sifting out of reality to the companies that are really doing something that's powerful and working and them gaining focus, them coming to the surface as being the ones we should be looking to. Well, and companies that get it 
that understand the realities of the situation and are playing to it and making it happen. We're seeing more of it, and then we're seeing other companies developing technology that is helping to enhance that shopping experience. Make that a reality, right. yeah. Make it seamless because that's what it needs to make it work. Right. So anyway, we hope that this episode kind of like in our debate about that, taking that on the air, is something that you appreciate, but we always love to hear from you and hear your thoughts on it. So please send us a message on 3dstartpoint.com. Either send us an info at 3 startpoint.com email or comment in the comment field of this blog post. And of course, you can reach us on social media at 3D Startpoint. Yeah, there's so <laughs> many ways to reach us. If you have something to talk about, you really have no excuse. Come on. So. Come talk to us. <laughs> well, thanks for listening, everybody. This has been Tom and Tracy. On the WTFFF 3D Printing Podcast. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.